real pleasure to be here. Just want to acknowledge uh, Will Knight as well, who's one of our PhD students who's been working very closely on this project. And we've been looking at how the British public have accepted or not accepted shale gas. And the rationale for this project started in 2011 when I was reading some of the reports of the extensive damage caused by quadrillas fracking in Blackpool. And I knew that we had a problem because I could not imagine that a 2.3 earthquake could cause quite the extent of damage that uh, was being portrayed in, in, in the media. And uh, I was amazed to hear of the cracks and things that were occurring in people's houses, particularly people who are related to Mike Hill. Um, <laughs> this, this one, oh, we'll do this one. So we started off and we started, we did quite a lot of interviews and reading the literature about what people were saying about shale gas. And after a while we thought, actually what we want is to get a sense of what the British public think about this subject area. There's been a lot of news, a lot of newspaper reports. And we started off by, with a, a little bit of help from YouGov, who agreed to throw out some questions for free for us, because we're always looking for free money. And we decided to think, well, who knows about shale gas? So we started off with a little survey and said, right, this is a fossil fuel, sedimentary rock that's more than 1,000 metres below the ground, and we extract it using a technique called hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And that was an important word, because every time you see the media, it says fracking, and it says this, shale gas. <coughs> so we asked people, OK, what is it? Is it a, of, out of these four, uh, sorry, six choices, can you identify shale gas? And we started surveying three years ago now. And when we first started, around about 37% of our survey population could identify shale gas. And what we saw throughout uh, 2012 and coming up to the end of 2012, a really significant increase in recognition to about here, where we're at over 70% of the people we're surveying can get that right, which is incredible. If you go to the United States, even in areas where they frack, and you put out exactly the same question, which is what we've done, that's what you'll get, 37%, even now, despite everything. So high levels of recognition in the UK. So there we go. This period is quite important, that second one, because that was a period that we were often referred to as the Balkan protests when we heard quite a lot about shale gas, but actually recognition hardly changed at all in this country. So very little change. So we asked people, well, what's it about? And we looked at all the things that people are concerned about. So first of all is earthquakes, and you can see that quite a lot of people associate it with earthquakes. And uh, that point there is where we had the Priest Hall report being um, released, and everybody said it's going to cause us earthquakes. But actually, Look at what happened since Balkan, because we're seeing that people are becoming less concerned about earthquakes, quite significantly less concerned. And if you look at the media, they don't mention earthquakes at all. So there's quite a lot of money being invested in earthquake mitigation and checking it, but actually most people aren't that really worried about it. Is it a clean energy source? We've heard a lot in the press about gas in particular being far cleaner than any other of the sort of resources that we have in terms of fossil fuels. And if you look here, it's whether you associate it with, don't associate it, or don't know whether a shale gas is a clean energy source. And you can see, as we go, it started off our survey, most people think it's dirty. And by 2013, uh, July 2013, actually we're seeing things even out a bit. And people are beginning to think, oh, maybe it's cleaner than we thought. And then we had Balkan. And what we see is, boom, it goes the other way. So an argument was being made there about this being a clean energy source that the public are picking up on. And Matt will talk a little bit more about this in detail, about what was happening in this period. So the big issue that we've <coughs> found with all, with all of the surveys we've done, we've just asked this question, do you associate shale gas with water contamination? And what you can see here is when we started our survey, people really thought, yeah, this is going to cause us a problem. And they, they don't know why, but they think that shale gas extraction will cause problems with water contamination. Throughout 2012, up into 2013, it's de decreasing. And just before the Balkan, uh, uh, and I was going to say riots, but they were protests, we can find that actually people are beginning to start thinking, well, is it? Is it going to cause water contamination or not? The focus of those protests, however, was about water. What uh, this 
technique would do in terms of uh, contamination of water. And so we've seen quite significant changes happening in terms of how the UK public perceive it. So in our most recent survey, what we're seeing is that the majority of people do think there's an issue with water contamination. So we've had people looking at shale gas in terms of local problems, impact on you know, water quality, impacts on earthquakes, etc. And then there's a, a bigger picture. What impact might the burning of shale gas have on greenhouse gases? Because what we're seeing is some very different arguments beginning to emerge, the local arguments and the more sort of national and, and, and arguments that are picked up by Friends of the Earth, for example. And what you can see here is that there is absolutely no consensus other than the fact that people don't know. Because the green are our don't knows. And we see this time and time again that there is, if there's an argument to be had here, it's what is the impact of burning shale gas on climate change? The one thing, though, that people are very clear about that is that shale gas will result in cheap energy. Now, that's notwithstanding the fact that many of the people who are in the sector in the UK are saying, actually, it's not going to result in cheaper energy at all. The governments use this quite often and discuss it. But, what, but the actual interest is saying, well, no, it probably won't because of the way in which gas markets work. But what we're finding is the majority of the people that are answering our surveys, and I should say these are not small surveys. We've talked to over 30,000 people while we've been doing this. So these are big surveys. They think it will result in cheaper energy. And although we've seen a little dip since Balcom, it's very much up there in people's mind. People also think it's going to result in bring economic benefits to the UK. And this is a really important issue. And if any of you have found the shale gas MOOC that Will and uh, Matt and I are running at the moment, <coughs> you'll see that actually one of the big debates that's going on in the classroom is around what are the economic benefits of uh, extracting shale gas and what are the risks to the economy of not extracting it, which is becoming an important issue. What's important is men are much more convinced by this factor than women. And throughout our data sets, what we're finding is men and women think very differently about shale gas. Women are far more concerned about it, far less likely to identify it in our, uh, our question, and, uh, our, our sort of gateway question. And in fact, over 80% of men will identify shale gas correctly. But the other thing that people are very convinced about is this, uh, this idea of uh, energy security. I'm not entirely sure that people actually know what energy security is because we can see when we're asking them in the MOOC what do you mean by energy security and we ask them to write it down and then Matt tells them what it is. They don't actually know particularly what it is but they know it means that we won't be getting our gas from Russia. The fact that we're not anyway is to beside the point. <laughs> but um, what you can see is by and large people think it's got something to do with energy security. So we then say, after we've taken people through a series of questions, should it be allowed? Should we be allowed to extract shale gas in this country? Now, if we are to believe the press, nobody, nobody bar a few industrial people and some engineers want shale gas. But actually, it's a, it is the majority. And only once in the three years that we've been running have we gone under 50% of our survey saying we should not allow shale gas to be extracted. There is clearly a significant uh, level of no's, and if we take a look here, that's our peak at 58%, and there's a differential of 39, nearly 40% between the yeses and the no's. So that was when it was actually at its peak of when people were saying, yeah, we should go for this. If we look at it now, well, this is our most recent survey, which is uh, in September, we we're at 505 and we've only got a differential of 21%. So we have seen some sort of shortening or some, you know, reduction <coughs> in overall support. But it's still a strong support. And I'll tell you, the Labour Party or the Conservative Party would be very glad of that differential at the moment. <laughs> but then we look at it by gender. And that's when you start to see these differences coming out quite significantly. So you can see what was happening at the beginning of our survey. And then what happened just before Balcom and our most recent survey, throughout all of this, women are the least likely to be in favour 
of shale gas, although they still are the biggest group. They're certainly not a majority. But look at men in July 2013. That was a significant, uh, you know, that is an overwhelming majority. We've asked a little bit about whether or not, you know, companies should pay compensation, whether there should be community benefits. We said, well, what's it for? And unfortunately, that is seen as a bribe uh, in many, many people's eyes. And I think it's really important that if the industry is going to be able to operate, it's got to get across the message that this is a community benefit. It will benefit you. And what is quite interesting is probably saying, actually, we're not that bothered about money, but if you give us free gas as a result, that would probably be quite a good thing. <laughs> so whenever we're talking about shale, and I think one of the things that's really interesting is shale has been seen in isolation. It's been seen by the public in isolation. It's not been seen up against nuclear or coal or oil. It's, this is quite often seen as something that will have a negative impact on the environment. So we asked people, what should be in the energy mix in 2025, which is only 15 years away? And as you can see, they all want uh, tidal. Where it's going to come from at the moment, I don't know. But they want wind, and they want hydro, and they all want solar. And they all want conventional gas. And actually, it's quite staggering, the percentage. It's roughly between sort of 75 and 80% of the people say, yeah, Natural gas should be part of our energy mix in, the, in, in, 20, in 15 years' time. But shale gas, whew, no, can't have that. And in fact, it's the least likely, apart from people aren't quite sure what biomass is, mm. but it's the least likely to be acceptable to the British public. Now, it's the same thing. It's methane. It, it's produced in the same way. So there is clearly, it, it, it's, it, it's got a bit of a, you know, an issue in, in, in what people think of the uh, shale gas as an energy source. It, it needs a makeover very, very quickly. So Matt is going to just talk about Balcom, because Balcom is your turning point. And actually, um, we think you've got a long way to come back after Balcom, because they did quite a bit of damage in a very small way that's beginning to build. Yeah, so thank you, sir. <coughs> So, so when Sarah and I were first talking about the possibility of doing some uh, survey work around uh, shale gas, one of, the things, one of the things we thought was that this could actually be a, an interesting exercise, a kind of natural experiment in something that may well become politicised. So in 2011, it's not being that much talked about. Uh, there are some rumblings around police hall and so on. Uh, but we imagine this is going to get increasingly politicised as time goes by, and it would allow us to look at what happens during that process. Now, a lot of those slides you just looked at with Sarah, right, water contamination, greenhouse gas emissions. Is it a cheap form of energy? Is it a clean form of energy? You see, all of the indicators moving in favour of shale gas. So even when the majority of people are against it, right, public opinion is moving in favour of shale gas. Right? People are warming to it. Uh, now, we tried to get the press interested in this. We thought this was a really interesting story. That Despite a lot of negative coverage in the media, the British public were warming towards uh, shale gas. Um, could we get any newspaper interested in this? No, not at all. Right? No, nobody's interested in a story that says... Uh, shale gas is becoming more popular. And it moves in a positive direction in all those indicators until July 2013. Okay, and then what happens? Well, you'll know what happens in July and August 2013. Uh, right, this is, this is what happens. It happens in the summer, <coughs> right? It's a silly season. There are no proper news stories around because all the MPs are away in Tuscany. Uh, and so this really, really grabs the headlines, right? Protests at Balkan. And what's the thing that the protests of Balkan really, really focused on? Okay, water contamination. Right? The, the main theme of the Balkan protests was about water contamination. Why? Well, not least because that particular site is only a couple of miles away from here, right? Ardingly uh, Reservoir. Uh, Balkan has the other advantage, right? It's, it's, it's very close to London. So journalists can get down to Balkan, they can talk to some people, they can go back again, file their story. Uh, when we presented this up in Manchester, uh, there were some people there from the Barton Moss protest, protest camp. And, and they were, well, you said in, you're trying to tell me that, that this was somehow a more important news story than, than Barton Moss. Well, the fact is, frankly, in a sense, it was, right? Because it was close to London and because the journalists could get there, this got an awful lot more coverage uh, than, than Barton Moss did. Okay, so we have a news story with an awful lot of coverage. And what you see after July 2013 
It's all of those indicators, I mean, it's quite a remarkable effect, right, that all of those indicators that were moving in favour of shale in terms of public perceptions up to July 2013 then turned down and turned against it. Right? Every single one. Uh, it's a remarkably consistent picture. And if we look at some of the quotes from Balkan, right, this is some of the protesters. Will Knight down here, our uh, PhD student on, the, on this project, is also running the MOOC with us, has done a lot of interviews with, with activists. Okay, lots and lots of them could give you many more quotes like this, all saying that when it comes to Balkan, what they were really concerned about was water. When we asked people in the most recent survey, what are you most concerned about? And they could answer on a scale from 0 to 10. What most people are most concerned about is water contamination. <coughs> right? This comes through really, really consistently. Right? Somebody mentioned earlier, right, managing the politics of this. Right? Managing the politics of this is about addressing people's concerns, above all, about water contamination. Now, one of the ways in which we can divide up our data is in terms of the readership of daily newspapers. <laughs> so I thought I'd look at this in terms of this, uh, this, this Balkan turn. And what we see here are readers in, in green of The Guardian and The Independent, and in blue, readers of The Times and The Telegraph. And we know that there's quite a close correlation between readership of these newspapers and what people tend to think about shale gas extraction. As you might expect, it's entirely intuitive. Guardian and Independent readers are much more sceptical. Times and Telegraph readers uh, tend to be more supportive. Now, look, this is really interesting. I think, well, look what's happening up to that July 2013. Right? These are the don't knows. These are people who do not know whether or not shale gas extraction should be allowed. Guardian and Times, Guardian and Independent readers becoming more and more uncertain. Right? That number rises from 20 to 30 percent who are unsure. So at a time when public opinion is moving in favour, the resistance of the Guardian and Independent readers is beginning to crumble a little bit. Well, you know, maybe you know, it's cleaner than coal. It could be a transition fuel to renewables. Uh, you know, we're not so sure what to think. Uh, Times Telegraph readers tend to be in favour anyway, and they're actually becoming slightly more supportive. After the Balkan protests, you see the trends reverse. In particular, Guardian and Independent readers right, we come back down actually now below 20%, who I don't know. And where do they go? Right? Well, they break for nose. Right? So that July 2013 figure, do not support shale gas extraction, 40%, rises after Balkan to 50%. And, and this is unusual, stays there. Right? Throughout the rest of the surveys, that's not a blip. That level of support goes up and stays there. So this, suddenly these people, right, they, know, they know what to think now. Right? They've seen a bunch of people in tie-dye t-shirts telling them this is really bad. So they know it's bad. Right? And they keep thinking it's bad all the way up to September 2014. Now, this is different to areas where public perceptions are settled. Right? Take the public view of MPs. We've got a number of people at Nottingham who work on uh, standards in public life, looking at the public view of MPs. MPs are slightly more trusted than estate agents, uh, slightly less trusted than journalists, uh, for some reason much less trusted than university professors. I can't really imagine why that is. Sometimes that moves a bit. It, moves a bit, it moved a bit at the signs of the expenses scandal. It may move a bit again now with Jack Straw and Malcolm Rifkind <laughs> being in trouble. But it goes back very quickly. Right? These disturbances don't last for this length of time. They might last a month, and then people just go back to their settled view about MPs and how trustworthy they are. The difference here is that there is no settled public opinion about shale gas to return to. Right? So the, the reason, why, is Balkan, why does Balkan seem to be so powerful? Right? I would suggest the reason is that it's happening at a time when public opinion is actually settling around this new technology that people are not familiar with before. Look at this, right? Labour and Liberal Democrat voters. Again, up to July 2013, this should say do not support shale gas. Right? The number who do not support shale gas extraction is declining. Declines to do July 2013, that high point for, for public approval. Then we get Balkan, and then again, we see Labour and Lib Dems, right, their positions harden. This, this issue begins to really divide now along party lines much more, much more substantively uh, than it was before. And again, the change is sustained. Now, it begins to dip a little bit between the May and September 2014 surveys. I'm really looking forward to the next survey running where we can see if, that, if, if, these, if these trends begin to come together again. Uh, in the spring of 2015 or not. But again, in terms of changes in public opinion, right, this is a long, long time for, for, a, for a change to, to be sustained. Right? It all tends to suggest that the key thing with Balkan is about timing. Right? And other protest groups believe they've learned this from Balkan as well. Right? So again, these come from Wills, 
uh, interviews uh, here with uh, protesters at other sites which have come after Balkan, such as Barton Moss uh, and such as Upton. All right. And the protesters feel they, they have learned something from the Balkan case and the impact that that seems to have had, and that this kind of political mobilization works. Now, does that doesn't mean you're going to see an awful lot more Balkans. Well, I don't think that's certain at all, right? Because these are also quite difficult to sustain. You have to sustain high levels of mobilization to keep Balkan-type process alive. But it's part of the reason why I suspect there are at least small protest camps at just about every single site that may come to frack in the near future. Okay? The protesters think Balkan was hugely effective, led to a long-term change in public opinion. Part of the reason they think that is because they've read the Nottingham surveys. Uh, so they think this is an effective kind of politics. Okay, and we see it reflected as well uh, in the newspaper headlines. And as I say, the key thing here is, right, it's all about timing. Balkan happens at a point at which public opinion uh, is actually forming, not at a time when there is a settled public opinion that can be uh, returned to. Uh, I can't resist this. Uh, Hands-on experience of, uh, of fracturing, so I obviously <laughs> know what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, that's about it, really. Uh, it's all about timing. Okay, thank you.